Today we're going to take a look at enterobacteriaceae and biochemical testing. Now these are two different subjects combined into one session here. Enterobacteriaceae are a group of bacteria. Biochemical testing is a way to differentiate them. In other words, we can use that to tell them apart one from the next. So let's take a look at the enterobacteriaceae here as we get into this. Enterobacteriaceae are more commonly referred to as enterics. And what these are, they are a group of bacteria that tend to inhabit the intestinal tracts of humans and animals. Now, from a visual standpoint, if we do a micros microscopic examination, we're going to see that morphologically, all the members within this group pretty much look identical. And there's over a hundred different species here. So what they look like is they're gram-negative, rod-shaped, in other words, bacilli, bacilli or rod-shaped bacteria that occur in a singular arrangement. Now, if we do additional examination, we can also see that they have a what's called a peritrichus flagella arrangement. And we can determine this by, by gram staining. So if we, if we do a gram stain on an unknown bacterium, we can put it in the enterobacteriaceae group based upon all these characteristics. And it also helps to have some of the environmental information. Where did it come from? Was this isolated from a patient? Was this isolated from somewhere in the environment? That often goes into it as well. But once we have that information, we can actually determine, okay, this is an enteric. The problem is we don't know which of the enterics it is. So there's over, well over 100 species, and they're all very different. And some of these are pathogens, and some of these are harmless. So it is helpful to know which is you're looking at. So although they're identical in appearance, each of them have their own metabolic characteristics. So take E. coli versus salmonella. Although E. coli can be pathogenic, more often it's a harmless, beneficial intestinal bacteria. Salmonella, on the other hand, is almost never beneficial. It is a harmful pathogen that causes uh, intestinal disorders. Part of the difference here is that each of them can produce their own unique enzymes, and they have their own self-features, things like toxins and things like that. So although they look the same on the surface, their biochemistry is very different. So they can be producing different enzymes. Enzymes have their own substrates that can be broken down into their own products and byproducts. So this is not a lesson on enzymes. Hopefully you're familiar with that already. But enzymes can each behave differently. So even though they look the same, they do not produce the same enzymes. And so what this leads to then is that different types of enzymes, different types of substrates, products can have different types of interactions with the host. So all of that can then make some of these bacteria good and then some of these bad. So just because they look the same doesn't mean they function the same. So this makes some of them dangerous, some of them harmless, and some of them are actually beneficial. And those can change, so they're not set in stone. But in general, these types of metabolic properties enzymes, substrates, the byproducts of those substrates, these types of things can really kind of categorize microbes into one of these three general categories. Harmful, more or less neutral, and actually beneficial. Now, you cannot determine just by looking at the bacteria what kind of enzymes or substrates or byproducts you're looking at. These are not able to be seen with any kind of microscope. Um, even the most advanced microscopes Enzymes are a type of protein. These are too small to be seen, even with advanced microscopy. So you don't get to see them directly. What you have to do is you have to test for them indirectly. And this is where the idea of biochemical testing comes in. So what a biochemical test helps us do is it helps us highlight the presence or absence of specific types of, of um, metabolic products. So these could be enzymes, the, the substrates, the byproducts of those substrates, things like that. And there's lots of different types of biochemical tests, but in general, what they do is they help us highlight the presence or absence of all these different metabolic properties. Now, the way biochemical tests work in general, and I am speaking kind of broadly here, but the way they work in general is biochemical tests are set up to allow microbes to grow on them. So they're really used just like a type of media that we've used already in this semester, like an auger plate or um, a test tube with a type of culture media in there. So it, on the surface, they look really just like a, a type of media that's used. But in reality, these are special kind of media. And when the microbes grow, the media is formulated to really highlight some specific biochemical aspect 
of their growth. So it's not just used to grow them, it's used to grow them in, in a means to highlight their metabolic differences. Now, it starts off just like any other kind of media. We culture them and we let that grow for about 24 to 48 hours. Now, once the, the test is, is done growing, we take a look and we can look for the results in reference to things like color changes and the production of gas. And again, I'm speaking broadly, so every test is going to be a little bit different, and we're going to get into some examples here. But in general, the tests are, are going to change colors or put off a gas or sometimes both. And what you have to be able to do then is look at each type of test and know how to interpret what those color changes mean and what the production or the absence of gas means. So all of those things will tell the interpreter something about the microbe if they know what they're looking at. Okay. Now, every biochemical test is different. In order to know, you have to just look at each individual test. Now, we're not going to get into all the tests today. The goal here is not to learn every biochemical test that exists because there are dozens of them and we're not trying to get that specific. But let's take a look at some examples here to give you a better idea how this can work. So one example is called the catalase test. And what the catalase test does is it helps identify the enzyme catalase. So catalase is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide. Now, if you breathe oxygen, if you respire oxygen more technically, one of the things that can happen in that process is you can actually produce hydrogen peroxide, believe it or not, as a byproduct of oxygen metabolism. Now, hydrogen peroxide can be harmful to the cell. So in order to deal with the harmful byproduct of oxygen, cells have evolved an enzyme called catalase. And what catalase does is it takes hydrogen peroxide and splits it apart to make water and oxygen, two harmless byproducts. So if we're breathing oxygen, we will have to deal with hydrogen peroxide. And the enzyme catalase helps us neutralize that into two harmless substances. Okay, so that's the idea of catalase. Now, some organisms produce catalase and some do not. So there's a difference. And the way to tell if a microbe produces catalase or not is we just take a small amount of our growth. Now this one in particular doesn't require a specific media. We can pretty much grow them on any kind of media. So we take a small amount of the inoculum and what we do is we add 3% hydrogen peroxide directly to that inoculum. Usually just one drop is all you need. Now if that reaction gives off a gas. In other words, if we put the hydrogen peroxide on there and we immediately see bubbles start to come to the surface, what that means is that oxygen is being released. That's what the bubbles are being created from is the release of oxygen. And that means that the enzyme has catalase, which is taking the hydrogen peroxide and converting it into water and gas. And we can't see the water, but we can see the oxygen gas. So gas is an immediate indication of a positive result. So in other words, that microbe produces catalase and therefore reacts to make oxygen. If we don't have catalase, nothing will happen. We'll just we'll add hydrogen peroxide and no bubbles occur. So this gives you an idea of how a biochemical test can work. This is a pretty simple one, but we have growth. We add a type of um, a test substance, a reagent. In this case, it's just basic hydrogen peroxide. And the way that hydrogen peroxide interacts tells us something about that microbe. So if we know how to interpret that, we know, okay, this is an enzyme catalase that's present in this microbe, present or absent. Now, what do you do with that information? Well, in certain cases that can be really, really helpful to know. So for example, if you're looking at two different species of a gram-positive bacilli, different type of microbe in this example, not an enteric, but Clostridium and Bacillus are both gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria. And it's almost impossible to determine the difference just by looking at them under a microscope and to just like before. So these two microbes look identical, but what's different about them is their reaction with catalase. So the Clostridium species will be catalase negative, while the, bac the Bacillus species will be catalase, catalase positive. So if we have an unknown and we can break it down to one of these two bacteria, which we can do in a large part just by, help, you know, it helps to have an interpretation of where it's coming from, some environmental information. But even with just the basic gram stain, we can 
break it down into one of these two groups. Once we have that, we don't know which is which, so we can use the catalase test to help us determine. Okay, if it's catalase negative, that means it's a clostridium species. If it's a catalase positive, that means it's a bacillus species. So that information can then help us decide what group are we looking at here. So this is sort of the nature of biochemical testing, and the catalase test gives us a little bit of insight into how that can kind of work. The problem is it, it's usually not the case that one test by itself is enough to give us all the information that we need. So when it comes to the nature of biochemical testing, what I'm trying to get at here is that individual tests tell us sort of one thing about a bacteria. It's sort of like asking them a yes or no question. Do you produce catalase? Yes or no. To learn more about the bacteria, we can run more tests. And each test that we run is sort of like asking another yes or no question. And every time we ask another question, we get more information about that bacteria. So typically what you need to do is you need to run multiple tests together in a series, or in other words, all at once. And this creates what's called a biochemical profile. And a profile is sort of a combination of results that when added up, can really narrow down or point to a specific species as a combination of all the different characteristics being looked at at once. So let's take another example. Let's take that last example and carry that forward a little bit to help you better understand this here. So in that last example, we took Clostridium and Bacillus. Let's say that we had those two once again, Clostridium and Bacillus. We don't know which is which. We run the catalase test, and the catalase test tells us that it's a member of the Clostridium genus. So it comes back catalase negative, and we say, okay, it's not Bacillus, it's Clostridium. Well. Clostridium has a handful of different species within that group. So Clostridium is it was called a genus in which you have multiple members that are within that genus. So we don't really know which of the members of the Clostridium species we're talking about. We, we know it's not a Bacillus, but we don't know which Clostridium species we want to know. If you want to know that, which by the way, you don't always have to know, but if you want to know what species you're looking at, you would then need to run additional testing. So here's, we're not going to get into all these tests, but some examples here, we could do a motility test. We can do a lechen C test, lipase hydrolysis, etc. And the results of these tests will start to rule out some species or confirm other species. So if we look at, for example, lipase hydrolysis, if we have a positive for lipase hydrolysis, that narrows it down to Clostridium botulinum, type A, B, or F, or Clostridium botulinum, C, D, or E. So that test alone can tell you that it's one of these two. And if we want to know more information, something like proteolytic activity can help us determine whether it's A, B, F, or C, D, or E. So these types of tests can be further evaluative to give us more and more information. So this is where one test can kind of help us differentiate big groups. Multiple tests help us narrow it down to the specific members of those groups. So that's what I mean by the nature of biochemical testing. The tests are like questions, yes or no. And when we ask lots of questions all at the same time, we get more information uh, about what we're looking at. So all of that sort of applies in general. The truth is there's lots of different groups of bacteria and different types of tests have been found to work better on different types of groups than others. So the, the principles are the same. We apply groups of tests to identify unknowns. But again, different groups will require their own different types of tests. So for example, if we identify with a gram stain, a gram positive cocci, we would have different testing protocols than we would for gram negative rods, like our enterics. So gram staining will help you find what group it belongs to. And then based upon that group, you can then determine what route of testing you want to go to figure out what member of that group you're looking at. So this is just a little flow chart here about what you would do with the gram positive cocci. So you would look at different types of tests. Catalase would be one of the first, and then you would look at coagulase or hemolysis, et cetera. We're not, again, not trying to get into every little detail here, but that kind of helps you understand, okay, gram positive cocci, we have sort of a flow chart of what types of tests we do and in what sequence we do them. So we want to look next here at a particular type. This is where we're going to get more specific here. We want to look at a specific group of tests called the MVIC test. The MVIC test is a biochemical test that's specifically used to differentiate key species of unknown enterics. 
So back to the enterics here. So these particular tests have been found to work really well when you've got a handful of enterics and you want to sort of narrow down which is which within that group. MVIC tests are quick and they help you sort of narrow that down. So the MVIC is an acronym that stands for Indole, Methyl Red, Vogue's Proscar, and Citrate. And we're going to get into each one of these tests here in, in just real briefly so you have a better idea of how these work. So four tests combined to make one sort of broad test called the MVIC biochemical test. Now each of these tests gives us information about our bacteria. And I'll show you how we're going to use all this at the end here. Indole is used to determine whether a microbe can convert tryptophan into indole. Tryptophan is an amino acid. So in order to convert tryptophan, an amino acid, into indole, a microbe has to have an enzyme called tryptophanase. So this is the enzyme responsible for this conversion. So if you have tryptophan and you've got tryptophanase, you can convert it into indole and then several other byproducts as well. Now, ultimately that's not that important, but what it does is it helps us determine whether a microbe is positive or negative. And this is a differential characteristic. Some will be positive, some will be negative. The way it works is we have a special kind of reagent called COVAX reagent. We add that to the test, and if we have a uh, color change, we'll see, uh, excuse me, if we have a red color change, that indicates a positive test, whereas no color change it sort of looks like a yellow, because that's actually the color of the reagent. That yellow color indicates that it's negative. So this is a chemical called COVAX reagent. COVAX reagent is added. If it changes red, we have a positive. If it has no color change, looks yellow, that's negative. So once we have that information, we can catalog that. We can just say, okay, this unknown is indole positive or indole negative. And that's one more characteristic that we now have about that microbe. The methyl red test is a test that uses the pH indicator methyl red. So methyl red is a pH indicator. pH is a measure of acids or bases. What we do with methyl red is we look to see whether or not microbes are turning their growth medium into a strong acid. So methyl red reacts and turns to a red color at a pH of 4.4 or below, which is a fairly strong acid. If you're at a pH of about 4.4, you're, you're looking at a fairly strong acidic characteristic. So when bacteria ferment certain types of sugars, especially glucose, and they use what's called the mixed acid pathway, mixed acid pathway is, is just a, a particular way of breaking down things like glucose. When they use this pathway, they will create lots of strong acids, and there's a mix of acids, hence the name the mixed acid pathway. So we produce things like lactate and formate and ethanol and acetate and succinate. These can act as, a, as acids and they lower the overall pH. So we can determine whether a microbe is using this pathway simply by adding methyl red to a solution, and methyl red if the pH is low enough, will turn a dark red color like this. And if it changes that color, that means that they're using the mixed acid pathway. So this is a common enough pathway. If we see these acids, we know they're using that pathway. And so we know, okay, they're using the mixed acid pathway. So we just simply add the pH indicator, red gives us a positive, and the, the solution itself is kind of a yellow orange color. And so if it remains that color, there'd be really no color change. And so we call that negative. So once again, we have more information. Are they using the mixed acid pathway? Yes or no. Vogue's Proskar, I believe these were the two scientists who discovered this test, Dr. Vogue's and Dr. Proskar, hence the funny name, is a test that's designed to highlight whether microbes use a different metabolic pathway. This pathway is known as the butylene glycol pathway. Another funny name here. But in the butylene glycol pathway, Rather than breaking things like glucose down into acid, they break them down into other chemicals. Chemicals like uh, acetoin um, and 2,3-butendiol. Don't worry about memorizing all these names. That's not the important part. The, the, the important part is, is that there's a different kind of pathway being used here. So we're looking at a different metabolic characteristic. So if they use this pathway, one of the things that's going to be given off in the, in the pathway is a molecule here called acetoin. And this molecule can then be tested to see if it's present. We can find whether or not it's present or absent based upon the use of a couple different test reagents. So we grow the microbe, and then what we do is we add two different reagents in this particular test. 
One is called alpha naphthol, and the other is 40% potassium hydroxide. Now you add those in a certain sequence, you mix them up, and what you then look for is a color change. Once again, um, a positive color or a positive test will have a red color change. A negative test will have no color change, which depending on how you're growing it, might look kind of like a, a brown color. So red is positive, anything else would be considered negative. So once again, more information. Are they using the butylene, butylene glycol pathway? Yes or no. The last part of the MVIC test is a, is a test called the citrate test. Citrate is an organic carbon compound that's heavily utilized in the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, in the cell respiration pathway. I'm not going to get into all that here, but you can see a quick little diagram of the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. Citrate sits right here at the beginning. It actually begins right here. Citrate is at the beginning of that pathway. So it's a pretty much a universal organic compound. Almost every organism on Earth will utilize this compound. So what we're looking at with this test, however, is whether or not they can survive if they only have citrate as their only carbon source. In other words, somebody figured out that if you take away all the other carbon compounds, all the glucose, the fructose, the lactose, all the different types of carbon that a cell would normally have, you take all those away and you provide it only citrate. If you do that, some microbes can still continue to grow despite the severe limitation of carbon and other microbes will not be able to grow. So once again, you have a differentiation. Microbes that can continue to grow only with citrate, what they'll do is they'll actually change the media as they grow from a green to a dark blue color. So a blue color in this test means positive. The media starts out as green by default. So after 24 to 48 hours, if it still remains green, we call that negative, a negative test. So color change is the, another indicator here of a positive. So collectively, each of these tests gives us just one little insight about a microbe. Do they use citrate as a sole carbon source? Can they use the mixed acid pathway? Do they produce indole? And individually, it's sort of like asking somebody a yes or no question. Do you have brown hair? Do you have blue eyes? Yes or no? And the more questions we ask, the more we know, the more we can start to determine about these microbes. Now, when collectively we run these tests, we can start to do a handful of things. In some cases, if you just want to rule out something, this may be enough information. You can say, okay, I was looking for an indole positive microbe, and this is an indole negative microbe. Therefore, it's not what I was looking for, and that's all I want to know. I can just rule it out. We can also narrow down the potential number. So we can say, okay, well, it could be any one of these 100 species, but after my MVIC, I've narrowed it down to only 10. In some cases, we can say, okay, we've narrowed it down to 10, and now I need to do run a couple of other tests so I know more about that. So I, you know, often narrowing down and running further tests kind of go hand in hand. Um, in some cases, it, if it's the right species, sometimes the MVIC test can actually tell you that it's a specific species. Sometimes the test results are, are specific enough that they indicate one species versus all others. So let's take a look at how this can be applied with a hypothetical example. Let's say you have an unknown gram-negative rod-shaped bacteria. In other words, you have an enteric. You know it's an enteric, so you run the MVIC biochemical test, and your results come back as follows. It's indole positive, methyl red positive, vogue's proscar negative, and citrate negative. What we can do is we can then take a look at a set of known characteristics for known often pathogens. So scientists know, okay, here's the pathogens that we're typically worried about, and here's the, the expected result for those pathogens. Based on the results that we see in our own test and the results that we know from previous research on these pathogens, we can look at the results and say, okay, it, it must be one of three species on this list. So we're indopositive, we're methyl red positive, Taking a look here, the only two that are both indole and methyl red positive, the only three, excuse me, are the top three here. E. coli, Edward Sela, I think, and Proteus, okay? The rest of those would not fit because 
they don't have the same characteristics. So they have to match all four in this example for it to be characteristic. So with this, we can say, okay, we can rule out over half. We can actually rule it down to three potential species here. So that's a, a big step. We've ruled out the majority of microbes on the sheet, narrowed it down to three. Now, in some cases, if we had different results, let's say we had positive, positive, negative, positive. In some cases, that one test, this, these, excuse me, these four tests alone could indicate Citrobacter coleseri. Uh, but since we have more of a broad test result here where we, we have a match with three different species, it just simply narrows it down. So in this case, what we'll do is say, okay, we know it's one of these three species. And so that's going to give us more information and we can run a couple more tests to narrow that down. In some cases, you don't necessarily have to. If you were worried about Klebsilia, for example, and you know it's not Klebsilia, that may be all you need to know. But if we want to know which of the three species left it is, we can run a couple other tests here. Okay, and I'm not going to get into to the nature of all these tests because there's really dozens of tests you could run. But a couple other tests that are important. One is called the hydrogen sulfide test. Another is called the urease test. So these are helpful, especially in narrowing down more specifics on these types of enterics. So if we run the hydrogen sulfide test and we come back negative, then we know that that is going to be E. coli because for hydrogen sulfide, E. coli is going to be negative, whereas the other two are going to be positive. Now, if we run the hydrogen sulfide and it's positive, then we can run another test called the urease test. And urease can then tell us which of the last two it might be. So if we have a urease positive test, it would be Proteus vulgaris, and a urease negative test would be Edwardia, uh, excuse me, Edwards telia tarda. So that's the idea. The testing can be done in series, and depending on the initial result, we can go further or we can stop and we can get the information that we need depending on the results here. So typically what you'll do is you'll run enough tests to get the information that you need, whether you're simply ruling something out or whether you're trying to get all the way down to the specific species. The amount of tests can be determined by what it is you're trying to learn and what you need to know about that microbe. So that's the idea. It provides bio biochemical testing, provides insight, and if you run enough tests and you do it correctly and you know how to interpret them, you will be able to determine the, the, the species of microbe that you're looking at in many cases. I will say it doesn't always work out. Sometimes the tests can come back inconclusive and these things can be a little more complex. This is really just a quick introduction to it all. There are some cases where you actually have a hard time getting the test to tell you exactly what you want to know. But in many cases, it will actually tell you the species of interest and will help you identify what you're looking at. All right, that's it for this lecture, and I will see you guys next time.